So Randy, um, to be respectful of the people that are here on time, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you. We'll just have to let other people kind of come on here. And I am gonna record this guys. Um, it's part of the reason why I'm redoing it actually. Randy did a training for us before, it was awesome. And I didn't record it. And I had a lot of people that couldn't make it that wanted to copy the recording. So most of you that are popping on here weren't at the last one anyway. So this is great, happy to have you. If you like these types of trainings, you can follow my wife and I on the Eventbrite that you registered on, and you'll just get a notification each time we uh, do a new training. Like tomorrow, we're doing a two hour class on 1031 exchanges, you know, for investors and for real estate agents. So that's gonna be a good class. So you can follow me on that, or, you know, go ahead and put your mobile number in the chat if you want, because when I, when I send out my invitation and my link to the new registration page for trainings, I usually do that like text. So you're welcome to do that as well. So Randy is actually my estate planning attorney and I love sharing my professionals with you guys that do a really good job. We were just talking before we let you guys in how a lot of these uh, professional uh, relationships are relationship driven. And so a referral, at least for me is huge because I won't just recommend just anybody. It has to be somebody that's really gonna make, make me look good but also have you thank me for the relationship. And uh, Randy's one of those guys, right? And so he's a specialist. Asset protection and estate planning is what he does. This isn't just one of the things in his uh, uh, arsenal of, of in being an attorney. So I love specialists and, and Randy's, he's my attorney for a reason. So I'm happy to introduce him. Um, Randy, I'm gonna let you just kind of take it over, add anything else you want as far as your background and your introduction. And even though we don't got uh, most of the registration people on here, I'll put something out later where we can get them a copy if they missed the introduction, but I'm gonna turn it over to you, buddy. Awesome, Jeff, you're the coolest as always. Um, yeah, I'll introduce myself for a minute. And, and I actually do like the fact that there's not a massive group right now, depending on the group size, I'll usually say, somebody please watch the chat if people are asking questions, but because the group's a little smaller, at least right now, just speak up if you've got a question in the middle of it, throw your question in the chat. If, if I don't notice it, hopefully Jeff's moderating and watching that. Um, so I can keep it a little more interactive. The smaller the group, the easier it is to kind of tailor the discussion towards what your questions are immediately. But um, before I get started, I'll, I'll preface what my, um, what I intend to talk about today. And before that, a little bit of my background for the last, you know, dozen years, I've been a estate planning and asset protection attorney. So, so when I decided to go to law school, I was already 30 at the time. And so this was a later decision in my life. And I intentionally went to law school to only do this. So I just had to get through criminal law and constitutional law and all that stuff. I wanted to be an estate planning attorney. After law school, I went and I got a master's of law in tax law. Um, at Georgetown in, in DC so that I could, you, you really need to have that, that fundamental tax law understanding when you're dealing with estate planning. Um, and for the last you know, 10 plus years, I've focused very narrowly on, um, even with estate planning, my, my specialty has been a bit narrow on the, the foundational estate planning, which is what just about everybody needs. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is the foundational estate planning that everybody needs, what it is, what is, why does it matter, and what does it look like? And then we're gonna focus in on asset protection, which is what some people need. Um, people who have um, certain um, exposure risks or they have assets that have equity that, that invite risks themselves or their assets with equity that are worth protecting. So this is gonna be a lot of the people that you work with I would imagine, especially in the real estate world, that's one of the biggest things that people want to protect, either from the inheritance side, the way they pass these assets to their kids, or from the asset protection side during their lifetime. They say, look, if I get sued someday, is there a way that I can protect my most important, most valuable asset, which is my home, from, from potential um, exposure? So. So let me try and share my screen here and we'll dive in. And again, just let me know what questions you have. Okay, slideshow. All right, Jeff, did I do it right? Yep, you're up. Title slide. Okay, so we'll, let's talk about the essential 
um, estate planning that we that we're going to think about in life. So there's four main pillars that we're going to um, focus on. If you guys are looking at this on an iPhone, sorry if it's too small for you. <laughs> but the, the four main pillars that I focus on are control, asset protection, tax planning, and privacy. These are these four pillars of estate planning that we want to pay attention to. Um, from a control standpoint, we want to be able to decide if something happens to you, who's going to make your medical decisions? Who's going to take care of your kids? Who's going to manage the money for your kids or whoever until they're old enough? Um, if you don't have kids, who do you want the stuff to go to and how? Um, do you have any kids or, or family with special circumstances, special needs, children that have made poor decisions <laughs> um, or, or they have special disabilities or anything like that? You want to make charitable giving. You want to be able to control what you do with your stuff. So asset protection is the second pillar. I'm going to dive deeper into this in the last half of this, but essentially, um, people have different definitions of what they think asset protection is. Uh, we wanna focus on what are the nature of your assets and the nature of the risks that, that you face to put a plan together that can protect that the best way possible. So from a tax planning perspective, I'm not gonna dive really deep into this, but depending on the estate value um, or the, the, the plan that we're working with with somebody, we're gonna focus on some attack, some taxes. I focus a lot on federal estate and gift tax with people. Um, currently, it doesn't affect a lot of people because if you don't have more, if you're married and you don't have more than $22 million, you're not gonna have any estate taxes when you die. But that was under Trump's tax laws and Biden and the Democratic Congress are proposing to change that quite a bit. So it may be that a lot more people could have exposure to estate taxes unless we plan ahead. But there's a little bit more than just income taxes when we, when we do our plan. Um, privacy is another thing that people pay attention to. Um, so probate, let's talk about probate for just a second. We hear that word all the time. Um, in some states, it's a dirtier word than others. <laughs> I'll say that some states, California, we've got some, some, people, some folks out there from California, it's a lot more expensive and time consuming to go through the probate process there than it is in Utah, for example. However, it's still something that's worth avoiding, but what in the world is it? Um, a lot of you have probably dealt with it in your real estate dealings where you know, someone passes away and you're buying a house from, from an estate or you're selling something. You're, um, that's when they're transferring it through the probate process. Probate is the court supervised process of changing title to assets. So if Jeff dies and he's got a house titled in his name, his kids can't just go sell the house, right? The kids have to file a probate to be appointed as Jeff's executor, usually called a personal representative. That's kind of the modern word we use for executor now is personal representative. And the court gives the personal representative permission to stand in Jeff's shoes to access his accounts and assets and sell the house and gather, gather everything under the court supervision so that they can, they can administer the state. So court probate proceedings are public. So if you don't want people to know about your stuff and who it's going to and things like that, you don't want it to go through probate. So if you set up a revocable living trust or any trust for that matter, we can avoid going through the probate process. And that's one of the many other benefits that a, that a trust is gonna have. Um, so what are the tools? How do we get it done? Some of this might be familiar to, to many of you, but the basic, most fundamental foundational tools for estate planning that really just about everybody needs are the powers of attorney, which are medical powers of attorney, which is combined with a living will. And I mean, think about that. You want to decide, you can cr create a document that says, if I can't make my own medical decisions, I want my spouse to be able to make them for me. And if my spouse can't, I want my brother or my oldest child, but you get to outline that. And that person is who the medical providers are going to talk to, to make any of those decisions. And you've given them that authority. 
the living will, which is the second um, wrench on this thing, most of the time, those two documents are combined into one called an advanced healthcare directive, where it includes both of those in one. But the living will, please don't confuse that with your last will and testament. I didn't name any of these things, but that's a big point of confusion for a lot of people is people will call me saying, hey, I need to get a living will. What they mean is they want to have an inheritance plan, <laughs> a living will. I know what they're asking for, but a living will is basically your pull the plug provision in, in your healthcare documents. So that's where you'll outline, okay, if I'm on life support and there's no reasonable hope of recovery, pull the plug or keep me going as long as possible because maybe they'll figure something out. But that, that's what a living will is. Um, then we also want you to have a financial power of attorney. So during your lifetime, so the, the medical part and the financial part, these are things that are effective while you're still alive where you are giving someone else the authority to act on your behalf if you can't act for yourself. And that's what a financial power of attorney is. Um, you know, if you have a stroke or you're, you have dementia and now you can't act on your own behalf, sign documents, financial matters, um, you're giving that authority to someone else. You probably see this, people who have power of attorney to, to deal in real estate or or sell properties, you know, most often in real estate, they'll need a specific power of attorney with authority to act for that specific property or transaction. But that's what it is, is you're giving someone authority as your agent to act as if they were you. And it's really helpful to have that in your toolbox. Then the last two are a pour over will, which is like your last will and testament, but it's very specific in this case, because normally we think of a last will and testament as the document that outlines Upon my death, this is who I want to get my stuff and how I want them to get it. But a pour over will doesn't do that. A pour over will simply says, upon my death, if there's anything that is not in my trust, pour it in there. It's just a safety net, just sweep stuff into the trust if it wasn't already there. Because the last and most fundamental thing here is the living trust. Did Randy freeze for you guys too, or just me? Uh, yes, I think you lost him. Randy, if you can hear us, uh, you might need a reset. You're frozen. This is Randy's impersonation of a living trust. <laughs> living <laughs> will. <laughs> right, decision time. Um, so to him, we're probably all frozen. Maybe he got his signal interrupted. Hang tight, guys. We'll see if we can get him back. He's off altogether now. So he'll definitely notice that. Am I back? You're back. Don't know what happened there, folks, but let's get back to this thing. So I hope you're a good editor, Jeff, and you can cut out that glitch in the middle of this recording. I leave them in. It's just, it's just human stuff now. But, but anyhow, we, the revocable living trust is the, that most fundamental part of the plan. I've got a couple little flow um, pieces. Are you seeing the, the slide there? Yep. Okay, so I, I talked a little, little bit about these tools already. I'll skip through that. So he, here's a sample example of the, the flow of how a revocable trust foundational plan might, might go together. If you see the, the green box on the right, everybody's got to have their medical and financial powers of attorney. You know, this is for a married couple example, creating a joint revocable trust plan together. Um, I have this. You know, my wife and I create a, you know, we each have pour over wills that say upon our death, if there's anything that's not in our trust, put it in our joint revocable trust that we created together. And then after we pass away at the death of husband and wife at the bottom, it says, this is how we want to divide all that up among our kids. 
we don't want to just divide it up, sell everything, cash it out and write checks to all of our kids. One, because they might be too young. Two, they might be irresponsible. Or three, maybe they're responsible, but what if they get divorced or sued or bankrupt or something? I don't want the inheritance I left to my child to be at risk either. So instead, I've designed mine to say, upon my death, the trustee will divide the trust up into separate shares, one for each child and hold it in trust for them. And the trustee can let them use those assets or, or that money at any time. If they're young, the trustee can be in charge of it completely. But when my child is older and they're old enough to be in charge of it on their own, in mine, I said, if they're at least 30, they can be in charge of their own inheritance on their own, right? I have some clients that do similar, but with younger ages, some come to me and say, you know what, my kids are about 30, let's bump that up to 40. <laughs> um, but essentially, the reason it's beneficial for to leave it in these separate lifetime trusts for children upon my death is that if my child gets sued or divorced or bankrupt, that money's not in their hands and they're not going to lose it. It's protected for them. So this is a, a real nice way that you can leave that inheritance to them where they have access to it, but nobody else does. But if you, again, if you give them an outright gift where you title that inheritance in their own name or put it in their own account, it could be exposed to something like that. So um, here's another example. I'm gonna skip past this real quick, but this is sometimes I might have a, a husband and wife who rather than creating one joint trust together, they'll create a his and hers revocable trust. Um, one reason is possibly because this is a second marriage and they've come in with their own assets. And so we want to keep those separate. You know, if there's a divorce and there you have a prenuptial agreement or whatever, they've kept their, their separate assets separate. Um, another reason sometimes we do this is maybe one spouse is a physician, for example, or a business owner and has some more exposure. And they say, well, if I get sued someday, all of my assets are exposed. But what if I just keep my business and then we put the house and the savings in my spouse's trust? Then if I get sued, only my trust is exposed, but the house and savings that are in my spouse's trust are not. So this is a midpoint for asset protection planning. Um, so we evaluate that when we meet with people. But the inheritance side would be the same as, you know, both trusts could go to your children the same as the previous slide. So these are some of the, the who's in estate planning that we need to think about when you put this together. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, what do I need to think about before we talk? Um, it's a good idea to think about if you have minor kids, who would you want to be guardians for your kids? Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you do have guardians for kids, you don't have to tell them that you named them as guardian <laughs> in your will of your kids. Um, you can if you want. I, I often advise people, don't tell them. Just choose people that you know and trust, that you know would do it. I mean, you know the people that you're choosing for that. It may never happen. And you might change your mind in a year or two. <laughs> and if you've had this experience where you talk to your best friend saying, oh, we would really love it if you'd be guardian for our kids if something happens to us. And the next year you change their mind. Well, do you have to have that awkward conversation with your friend saying, uh, we chose someone else. So I, I, often I say, you know what, whoever you choose, keep it private because then you don't have to have that potentially awkward conversation if you change your mind. You also want to think about, well, who would you want to be in charge of the finances to be your personal representative or your trustee of your trust? And who would you want to make your medical decisions? Who would you want to be in charge of that? So those are things that people need to keep in mind. They don't have to have all the answers. We help them think through it and talk through it of who would be best. Do they want to have a family member or do they want to appoint a professional trustee or things like that? So other things to keep in mind, and I, I want to skip through this quick so we can start talking about the asset protection side, which I think is, is helpful to consider. But um, one of the things that I've noticed that causes the most contention with estate planning is tangible personal property. We're talking about mom's 
engagement ring and dad's guitar and things like that, right? You know, the, the memorabilia from dad's career. Um, so in fact, I'll use an example for that. We had a client several years ago who was a professional athlete. If everybody would know who he is and you know had accumulated all these these awards and trophies and memorabilia and you know real important stuff to the family right and he you know of all the millions of dollars that he was dealing with and dividing them when he passed away the thing that was stressing him out the most is what am i going to do about these things i don't want people fighting over it and so we want to have a process whether this is a family that's got almost nothing or this is a family that's got millions and millions of dollars, the tangible personal property, the sentimental things often are what get people fighting. So if you can provide a process for that. Now, I think it's more important to have a process, period, than what that process is. Although I do think that we can choose a process that's better than, than, than others. For example, um, what I recommend is that we provide a mechanism in your estate planning documents that says, if upon my death, I leave a list of tangible property and who I want it to go to, give that stuff to those people, right? So you have the option of saying, well, I want the piano to go to Jimmy and this to go to Johnny. But anything that's not on that list, or if you don't leave a list at all, at least your children or whomever has a mechanism or a, a process to follow like this. You might say, well, everyone's going to draw numbers out of a hat and they're going to just pick stuff going one through five. And then the next round, five through one, just windshield wiper back and forth. That's the process. Clean and simple. Sounds kind of too simple, um, but that's one option. I actually prefer instead of that to do something like this, because let's imagine the, that that option where you just had the kids draw numbers and pick stuff. Well, you got five kids and one of them was the piano player. You got one piano and she drew number five, but her big brother picked the piano when he drew number one. Cause he's like, I'm selling that Steinway, right? You know, and she didn't even have a chance. So, so what do we do? How, how do we make that maybe a little more, more fair, more reasonable? Um, a lot of people have had a good experience with this. We say the kids are going to get together, no spouses, just the kids. And they're all going to have an equal amount of fake money, monopoly money, keep track of it on the computer credits, whatever you want to do, but they all have an equal amount. And we say, now we're going to auction off everything with everybody's fake money. Who wants the piano? They want it bad enough. They bid on it. Everyone has a finite amount, so they're gonna treat it accordingly. So what that does is it gives everybody an equal chance to at least have the opportunity to bid on something that's meaningful to them. And if they don't want it, they don't waste their money on it. And the second reason I like that is that it's not real money. Because if, if the children were bidding with real dollars, you might have a child who's, you know, exited as some big tech startup for millions of dollars, and then another child that's a kindergarten teacher. They're equally happy, but they never will be on the same playing field financially. So, so that's why if you give them fake money in that little sphere, they're all on the same playing field. So, so that's one thought that, that I think is really important to include in any estate plan. So how do we get it done? Like any process, whether you're helping somebody sell their home or, or anything, you want to have some discovery and learn about it. And this is where the relationship, um, you know, Jeff was talking about how meaningful it is and important it is the, with relationships. But that's where you learn about people and what's meaningful to them. And this is a huge part of their life is they're, they're contemplating, <laughs> what if something tragic happens to me? Who do I love and care about and how do I want to take care of them and the values that I want to, to pass on. And so, it's, you know, I, I deal with a lot of people who shed tears when I have these conversations. And so it's important to have that discovery and learn about that. Then 
you know, usually in a, in the first discussion I have with people, you know, hour, two hours that we, that we go over their situations, I can recommend a plan, quote a flat fee to them for what we propose for them. And then we'll gather some information so we can put it together. We draft it, then we implement it, get the assets titled how it should be. And then on an ongoing basis, um, we periodically review that. Estate planning, um, any, any attorney that tells you you get it set up and then you're done and you don't need to do it anymore isn't really doing you a service because it's kind of like changing your oil. You don't need to change it as often as you fill your tank with gas but you need to change your oil from time to time. So circumstances are gonna change, your assets are gonna change, your kids are gonna change, um, who you wanna be trustee of your trust is gonna change as years go by, laws might change. So it's a good idea every so often to just check on it and see if it still looks the way that you want. Yeah, I, I tell people that at least once a year, you should review your own estate planning documents. Doesn't mean you got to call me for it. Just you review it, see if it still looks the way that you want. Um, but every couple of years, it's a good idea to review it with your attorney. If there are changes that you need to make, you can make them. Um, so now let's talk about asset protection. I, I haven't been watching Jeff. Has anybody had any questions that now that, that we've been going on this? If so, um, I have one. I was going to kind of leave it to the end. Um, it's kind of specific. Uh, Dimitri was asking. Um, your opinion on five component trusts. And I don't know if that's, I don't know much about that. Dimitri, you could ask a more specific question on a five component trust, or um, we can wait and just let Randy finish what he's doing and see if that answers your question. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah, I'll go through and, and Dimitri, I'll, if that answers some of your questions as we go through, otherwise, you know, chime in. For some reason, I can't see the-, the He's, He sent that just, box. he sent that one just to me. Yeah. So. Oh, I'll monitor it for you, Randy. Okay. So what in the world is asset protection? So it, every one of you has some sort of asset protection plan already. It, just the nature of, of living in life and doing business and driving a car, we all implement some asset protection. And okay, there's the chat. I found it. Um, so you have insurance. Um, we all, if you're running a business, you formed a business, you know, a corporation or an LLC, you own rental property, you put it in an LLC. It, so you've all done something for some type of asset protection. Um, it's a real crucial pillar to our state planning and some need it more than others um, because some have more exposure than others. And so we wanna use that to protect some assets in your estate. And it's not just while we're alive, but like we talked about a minute ago, you can pass the assets to your heirs in a more protective way also. So why do we need it? Well, we've got risk exposure coming from a bunch of different angles. Um, you know, two primarily are that those may come from our assets or directly based on what we do. So we've got asset-based risk and direct risk. So what's asset-based risk? You know, this is, I mean, it's in the definition. Um, you own a rental property. Well, the asset itself is what's inviting that risk exposure. You've got tenants in there that may get injured because of your failure to take care of the property, right? It, you know, you've got a storefront and people are coming and it's a slip and fall, right? There, there's risks that are just based on the asset that you have. And then there's direct risk. Think of the, the attorney, me, or, or the physician who their profession, that their actual personal actions are what invite their risk exposure for malpractice or, or liability lawsuits, for example. So how do we protect assets in both of those situations? Um, we can talk a little bit about that. So in any type of asset protection planning, what we're often doing is we're setting up an entity or a trust and we're changing ownership of assets. Why we do that is, is we want to, like I explained the, the example a minute ago where a husband and a wife possibly could create a his and a hers revocable trust instead of a joint trust. 
to give them some level of separation of ownership. Where if one spouse is the physician and the other spouse is a stay at home parent that doesn't have liability risk, let's put the house in that parent's trust. So, but anytime we're gonna transfer ownership of an asset, you know, to put it in their trust or to set up an irrevocable asset protection trust, for example, we want to think about fraudulent conveyances. Has anybody heard the term fraudulent conveyance before? What is a fraudulent transfer? So essentially this means this has everything to do with timing um, for the most part. If you say, oh crap, I just got sued or I just crashed, rear-ended somebody and they got injured really bad. I don't want them to come after me for everything I got. And I'm gonna, I wanna go put my house and my, my savings into a trust. Um, if you call me and say, Randy, in fact, this happened last night. My wife got a text message from a friend saying, hey, you know, one, does Randy do friends and family discounts? And two, something <laughs> happened and they want some protection. And, you know, my wife's been with me long enough that she knows the questions to ask. She's like, well, did something already happen? <laughs> so think about this. If you get sued today and you say, crap, I got to go hide my house and put it in an asset protection trust, it's kind of too late at that point because a creditor can reach into the trust and unwind that transfer if you've done it with the intent to avoid something that you know about. So any of this planning needs to be done in advance of a problem before the wind is blowing, really. So, so I've got a slide here um, listing some of the factors that we want to consider before doing any asset protection. Um, so not only do we want to worry about the timing, like have you already been sued? Have you already crashed your car into somebody? You know, has the, in, the injury or debt or problem already happened? Um, if so, it gets a little challenging. And as well as um, something that also causes a fraudulent transfer. And when I say fraudulent transfer, the, the laws have been changed and are, are, are changing to call this a, a voidable transfer because it, it's not criminal fraud, like you're going to jail. It's just, it means that the transfer can be voided and reversed, that a, that a creditor could actually get into the trust to access the asset. Um, um, if you transfer so much into an asset protection trust, for example, that afterwards you are insolvent, <laughs> that's also a fraudulent transfer. So when we do any of this planning, we want to think of it more of a, you're sitting at the poker table and you've got some chips on the table. Well, all those chips are at risk, right? You can play a good hand and you can earn a little. This is just doing business. It's living life. You're running your business and you're, you're exposing yourself to the risk of life. Um, you play a good hand, you earn some money. You play a bad hand, you lose some money. That, that's life. That's our business running. We sell some houses. We do some loan. Whatever it is that your business is doing, you're earning money or you're spending it or you're losing it or you play a bad hand, a deal goes wrong. That's life. So where you're sitting at the poker table. Well, you don't have to have all your chips at the table, right? That's what asset protection planning can do, is you can say, I'm gonna take some of my chips off the table. I'm gonna take my house and my savings off the table. So they are not at risk of all of those risks on the poker table, which is me being a physician and operating on people or me running a business or me you know, driving you know, hazmat trucks or you know, whatever I do for a living. So, um, so what are the tools for asset protection? Let's look. So there's some that are already built in. There are statutory protections where creditors can't just take everything we've got. Um, and I, you know, I talk about creditors where we're saying, um, you know, if everything goes bad and you get sued and something happens, you know, these potential creditors, we all have creditors, we have a loan or something like that. But if everything goes bad and we don't pay them and they come after us, um, Utah has some protection for our home equity. So if we get sued and we're going to go bankrupt or something, some of our home equity is exempt and they can't get it. But in Utah, that's very nominal. It's only 40,000 among a married couple that's protected. Um, 
where there's some other states like Texas and Florida that dramatically have more, they can protect the whole value of the home equity. It's, it could be millions of dollars of value. So, but Utah is not as protective. You know, California is also not as protective there. Um, depending on the state, your, your IRAs and 401k retirement accounts are protected. Creditors can't just go in and raid those either. And um, life insurance cash values have some protection as well. So there's some by statute that have some protection, but what do we do for the stuff that doesn't? Your general investment account or your savings or your house and things like that. Well, number one, I, I say this all the time. I don't sell insurance, but I might as well because I tell everybody, if you don't have an umbrella policy, you probably better go get one. Um, and wh when people come and see me, they're usually thinking about planning and getting things in order. So I suggest while you're having in the middle of this mindset, you might as well call your liability insurance person and just double check on your coverages. Just, just check on it and make sure that you feel like you've got good coverage because that's where you have exposure. This is where all of you already have some protection in place because you've got car insurance and homeowner's insurance and um, accident insurance or e &O insurance for your, your profession. Um, but umbrella coverage, if you don't have it, call your guy. <laughs> as soon as this is over, call your guy. It's so cheap and it's gonna add a big um, addition of coverage for almost nothing. And, and of course, you can't say what it costs for everybody. Everybody's risk exposure is different, but I pay about 150 bucks a year for a million dollar umbrella liability policy. Now I don't have, you know, fighting dogs in my backyard in a swimming pool or things like that, that, that broaden my risk. I'm saying it's pretty nominal to get umbrella coverage. So, but umbrella insurance doesn't cover everything because it'll cover certain types of liability that you have. But if you, um, you know, if your business fails, we have another economic collapse and things fail like that. Well, you know, that's not a liability per se where, where someone's suing you for that. It's, it's, you know, economic risk. So how do we do this? We can change ownership of assets with a high, high risk spouse and a low risk spouse. We talked about that a minute ago when, when um, I showed that example of a his and hers revocable trust plan. Um, for example, in this case, the high risk spouse, he might still continue to own his 401k and his life insurance policy, and maybe the LLC that he operates his business out of because that invites risk. But he puts the resident and his investment account in the other spouse's trust. So keeps that safe. Um, we can also compartmentalize risk. So I'm, I would assume that maybe some of you guys own some investment properties. You know, if you're in the real estate world, you either own some now or you help people that are our investors or you're on track to want to do that at some point. So I, I work with a lot of people who want to have um, some protection for the properties that they, that their investment properties, for example. So what do you do? The, the whole point of business entities, I mean, we call it a limited liability company for crying loud. I mean, the, it's in the name of what it is that it limits your liability exposure. So when you set up a business, a corporation, an LLC, a partnership, whatever that business structure is, the main point of it, other than to outline the agreement between the, the owners of the business for how they're gonna operate together and share in the profits is that they wanna keep the the risk of the business itself separate from their personal assets. So think about it. If you, if, if Microsoft has a big multi-million dollar lawsuit and they owe somebody a bunch of money, who's got to pay that bill? Microsoft. Bill Gates doesn't write the check, right? It's Microsoft's liability. Just because he's a shareholder doesn't mean he's personally exposed to that. So that's what that corporate veil is between the business's liabilities and you personally. So often we'll set up LLC structures for people with their business. I've got a simple structure here where, look, you got one or two rental properties and you say, well, how about I put my 
rental investment LL, uh, property into an LLC. So that at least if there's an injury or something related to that asset based risk, that risk stays isolated in that LLC and they can't pierce out and take my personal account and my home. Then sometimes people might have multiple rental properties. If you put five rental properties in one LLC, well, someone might get injured on one of those properties, but all the other four are exposed to the risk of the one if they're all pooled together. So sometimes people will say, you know what I'll do? I'll take my, in this slide here, four rental properties. I'll set up one LLC for each of those four and then isolate the risk from, from each other in that case. So that, that's an example that some do. I also have a lot of people who, um, rather than they got 20 rental properties, they don't set up 20 LLCs, they set up five and they just put four, of, four up properties in each of the five LLCs, for example, you know, they meet in the middle. So let's move on to this. So let's talk about asset protection trusts. I think this will be a good place to finish and then leave some, some room for some questions if we've got them. So one of the, the best ways to protect from personal liability, we talked about LLCs and setting up business structures to protect against liabilities as a result of what the business is doing you know, a rental property or an operating company. You set up a business to isolate the liabilities inside that company. But what do I do as a, you know, I'm a physician and I own my business and it's set up as a business entity, but I have, I'm finally making it. You know, I paid off my house and I've got an investment account and I got a place down in St. George, you know, that's kind of starting to build some equity. How, how do I get those chips off the table? This is, this is the real key and where there's some real opportunity for people to get some peace of mind um, is through the use of a trust. Now we've talked about trusts for estate planning, a revocable trust that everybody needs. Well, when we do a trust for asset protection, we're setting up a second bucket for them in addition to their, found, their main estate planning. And that's the second bucket to hold those chips were taken off the table. You say, all right, I don't want my house and my, and my investment account to be at risk of my personal liability exposure. So I'm gonna set up this irrevocable asset protection trust and just put these two chips into it, right? And then if I get sued sometime in the future, well, let's see here. So types of trust. Well, we talked about a revocable trust before. Revocable trusts are excellent for estate planning, but they don't protect assets because my creditor can get into my own personal revocable trust. But if we set up a, an asset protection trust, then my creditors can't get in there. It's an irrevocable trust that I can transfer some assets into it. So long as it's, you know, I don't have the wind blowing on me, there's it's not a fraudulent transfer like we talked about before, works super well. So I, I'm gonna give an example of that. Um, and, yeah, maybe I'll just leave this here. I might share a whiteboard if people have questions, but I'll give an example of an asset protection trust that worked. And, and Jeff, maybe I gave this example last time we did this, but several years ago, prior to the 2008 economic crisis, we had a client who was doing really well in their business in Utah County. And they had a paid off home in St. George. And they had an investment account with, that was growing. And they just purchased a home in Provo, which was their dream home and had almost no equity in it. But we said, okay, well, your business is cooking along. You want some protection, let's put your paid off St. George home and your investment account into this asset protection trust. And they, they said, great, yeah, we agree, that's a good idea. Well, wouldn't you know it, a couple of years later, the ec economic crisis came along and their business dried up and their business went bankrupt. It was, it was rolling along and they was just, you know, tons of money rolling in prior to that. But because of that e economic crisis, it failed and it went bankrupt and they personally went bankrupt and they lost their, their personal home back to the bank, had almost no equity in it because it was brand new. But in that bankruptcy, they did not lose their home in St. George. 
or their investment account, all of which would have been lost was it, were it not for that. So, so th that, that's the intent of what we're doing and, and can plan in advance for. So um, pretty, I, I think one of the keys to um, any planning is that we wanna make sure that it's something that people are comfortable with. And where I notice that people get a little nervous is if they feel like it's permanent. So I always remember that what irrevocable means when we're setting up a trust, irrevocable um, does not mean that it can't be changed or modified or unwound. Um, so all this stuff is, is really flexible. Um, so as circumstances change in the future, we can modify this to, to help people get where they want to go. So um, hopefully I didn't feel like I just steamrolled through all of that. I, I want this to be helpful for everyone, um, but I'm happy to address any questions you guys have now that I kind of spit it all out. <laughs> I think it's super helpful, Randy. I mean, all you can do really is go over all the different components of, of assembling the right asset protection or estate plan for everybody and then what happens next is we need to have an individual consult with you right so see how that applies to our individual situation right so dimitri um you had a question in there um i'm not sure if he answered it or not about the five component trusts uh some of that has to do with deferring taxes um much like our training tomorrow on 1031 exchanges, but this is done through a trust. So is, is there a specific question you want to ask Randy? Well, my question is just general, uh, generally the thought on this particular five uh, component trust package. I send the links to Randy to take a look. I didn't want to send the links to the whole group because it's somebody else doing their own thing. So I don't want to advertise somebody else. I just want Randy to take a look and just uh, uh, give, give, a, give, give some thoughts to the group on, on, on those type of trusts. Yeah, well, and that, I can pull that up and look at it. Maybe under the gun here, I've to yeah, have to it, read through all this. Maybe I can. <laughs> I, I, I would say the last link. Uh, you can see a quick checklist what those components are, and maybe if you if you could, could get a quick idea of what it is, maybe you could give some thoughts on this. But basically, the idea here is to set up a multi generational trusts that never expire. They revocable. You pay uh, all your bills out of those trusts. And, and they protect you out, uh, from liability, right? And it's also kind of expensive, this particular package, right? Yeah. So, but anyways, I wanna get, I wanna get a, uh, in, in the way it's being described, it's kind of the kind of trust that Rockefellers have, right? So that's, that's basically how I hear it being marketed uh, and would, would love to get some thoughts on, on this type of arrangement. And also, do you do those type of trusts as well? Yeah, so the answer is yes, trust that can be dynastic. I do it all the time. Okay. So. That, that I think is important is when, when you're leaving your inheritance to children or grandchildren and however that works. And that, that all depends on um, you know, what, we're, what we're dealing with. Sometimes I have families that come in with the, you know net worth of under a million dollars and they say, we want this to be dynastic for you know, our kids and grandkids for generations. And sometimes it's not practical to do that because you know, the butter gets spread too far on that toast when, when the, the assets going into it aren't large enough. Yep, but then exactly but but so we evaluate that with people now I, I have just glanced at this really quickly what you sent to me um i would say that th this is more of a tax planning thing that i don't believe works um where it's kind of a tax avoidance structure on this um but but isn't the idea of a dynastic uh, uh, trust also to have tax avoidance as part of this tax avoidance liability protection? Yeah, yeah, right? you're right. So from an estate tax perspective, which is a different tax regime, not not income taxes, um, but estate taxes deals with the privilege of transferring your assets to someone else upon your death. Is there going to be a tax on that? And the government says that yes, there is. Right now, it's forty percent. So for the privilege of transferring your wealth to your kids when you die, there's a 40% tax. Now it's not that bad because they say, well, the first 11.7 million, we're not gonna touch it. Only anything above that. Now this is federal government. Some states have a, have a state level tax on it. Utah does not, I'm grateful for that. Um, but um, so, so 
Yes, but the, there are some um, in what you sent to me right now, I'm just kind of picking it out. We were talking about this with my partners at a lunch the other day that the IRS is you know, really looking at this thing. My partner did get a call from the IRS the other day from a, an email that he had talked to us, somebody else about their, their criminal investigation on this is someone was, now, now, of course I haven't read through this in detail, but there are a couple of bullet points that look like there's possible recommendations of creating a certain type of trust that doesn't have to pay income taxes or it avoids a lot of income taxes while the trust is there. So got to evaluate that kind of stuff before we dive in. I, I, I understand. I, I have my expectations set appropriately with how much you can review on this meeting yeah. and how much you can answer. So it, yeah. it's totally cool. But that, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of planning that we can do from from how a trust is treated for tax purposes or asset protection purposes, and and keep that in mind too. Um, when you go out there, and when people say you, you might hear your accountant or somebody say, "Oh, irrevocable trust, that's going to pay way high taxes." One thing that if you just remember that I told you this right now, if you ever hear the word irrevocable trust. That has nothing to do with taxes. Just the word irrevocable doesn't tell you anything about how the trust is treated for tax purposes. All it tells you is you need to ask the question, how is that irrevocable trust treated for tax purposes? Because it could be treated many different ways. Uh, well, actually we have an issue in California right now. Uh, we, we passed Proposition 19 last year. Yes. That now, uh, right, so you, you, you probably heard about quite a bit, right? So, yeah, so, for so, property so, tax. Right, exactly. Property tax would goes would go up with inheritance, and this is one of those things that this type of irrevocable trust would address. Uh, it, it basically going to eliminate the issue. So, so a lot of people were rushing. I don't know how many, right? But some people were rushing to to put their stuff into trust before February something deadline, which is which is now passed. Uh, but but this is still going to be ongoing uh, tax planning question because properties are expected to keep appreciating. Yeah, in California, they're they're good at finding ways to, to tax people. I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead. I have a question. Right, Kathy. Uh, um, my husband and I, I'm 10 years older than him. I'll be 70 next week, and he's 60. We have three kids. Of course, they're in their 40s now, um, and a couple grandchildren. So we've never done a will, except when he was in the military, but I'm sure that that's old now because it's been out for you know many years now. But what kind of person, um, attorney or whatever, where do we even search for? I don't even know what to look for. You know, Kind of like asking, well, what do you, what do you look for in a realtor? Well, what do you look for in an attorney that, that specializes in this kind of stuff? Okay. And, where and do I begin? The, where do I begin? Yeah, where, where do you live, Kathy? I live in Washington State, which is a community property state. Yes, it is. So actually, well, you want to find an estate planning attorney, an attorney that specializes in estate planning and trusts. Um, you know, I, we've, we actually have Washington licensed attorneys in my office. We're not located in Washington, but we work for people from New York to LA and everything in between. But whether it's me or somebody else, you want someone that specializes in estate planning. And I, I would caution from going to a general attorney. You can look on any attorney's website in any small or large town in the country where they, they do a little bit of everything. And just if you look on their website, they'll say, <laughs> we do this and this and this and this. And at the bottom, they're like, and we do estate planning. You, you probably deserve to have somebody that that's their specialty. So Kathy, um, the obvious answer should be take the snapshot of that screen right here with Randy's contact information on it and reach out to Randy. This, this York and Howell and Guyman? Yep, that Rand, Randy Sparks, that's his firm that he's with. Oh, okay. He's here okay. in Utah, but he can help in any state across the country because okay. of um, their firm and different licensings that they've set up to be able to be not restricted geographically, okay? And the reason I'm introducing Randy to you guys is because he is a specialist, okay? This, this, all this whole topic on asset protection and estate planning, like I said, it's complex. 
you want somebody that really specializes in this. And so it's worthy of a one-on-one -on -one consultation to explain what your assets look like and um, what you would like to accomplish. And then Randy or somebody else on his team can help you out, outline a plan. I mean, you know, all we have is our house and, you know, a truck and a van and our furniture. And, mm -hmm. you know, he works for the federal government. Uh, I have reti uh, federal retirement myself. Um, and I mean, we don't have rental properties or anything like that. So it's pretty basic, I think. But, you know, I don't want my kids or anybody. And I want to leave some for my grandchildren, too. Um, you know, with me being 10 years older than my husband, you know, I mean, I could go first or he could go first or we both mm -hmm. go together. Who knows? Mm -hmm. No one knows, you know. So, yeah, if you figure out how to plan that, let me know. What's that? You know, if you know how to time time when you're going to go. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let me take a picture of this real quick. Yeah, so Dimitri, I'd recommend that to you as well. It sounds like you've got some strategies in mind that you want to set up the proper way. Um, and so Brandy or somebody on his team, just have, have a conversation. Say, this is what I have. This is what I want to accomplish and have a dialogue about a game plan is my suggestion. Yeah, from my perspective, this is not an immediate request, but I have those questions come up with clients now and then. So the links that I sent to Randy, this is, uh, I, I, I recently referred one of the clients to this. She ended up not doing, actually it was end of the last year. She wanted to figure out how to uh, do a uh, swap and drop, being one partner of an in LLC that owned the duplex. And then she looked at this, she ended up not doing anything, but that's how I really learned quite a bit about those five component trusts. And this, it, they just intrigued me, right? I just wanna have all my estate planning options for my clients whenever they ask and I wanna understand what those options are. Absolutely, yeah. that's one of the benefits we bring as real estate agents, right? Is we can be that uh, referral source. I, I don't know that much about estate planning, right? I know enough to know who to call. And that's one of the reasons why we do these trainings is because you got a general overview. This wasn't a specific to any one of us, but now hopefully you have an advocate in this arena when your clients are asking you questions, you say, you know what? I'm not an attorney. I don't, I can't answer these questions, but here's the number of a guy that can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Awesome, thanks for that input. Anybody else have any questions for Andy while we got him? Yeah, David here. Um, my main concern in starting a growing portfolio of rental properties is protecting the house, uh, my, my main primary residence for my wife and kids. Uh, the, the house is in her name. I'm not on the, the title or the, the loan due to a later marriage, but I don't want to own a rental property that puts her at risk being a marital property estate. Um, but we wouldn't want to give up the freedom of being able to sell the house later or, or, or do whatever we want with it. If we put our primary residence into an irrevocable trust, which in my mind has always been you can't touch it, are we giving up that freedom of, of changing that later? Is that irrevocable, the best thing to protect the primary if we want to maybe sell it in 10 years or 15 years? Yeah, actually, you're not restricted from, from selling the house or replacing it at any point in the future. And so that's one thing I want to kind of reiterate is that irrevocable trusts are not, they, they don't have to be restricted. Okay. So, I mean, we need to, they're sophisticated instruments, but they don't have to be complicated. And, um, you know, I've done the same thing with my own. You know, my home in an irrevocable trust and you know, I've refinanced it or you can sell the home and replace it with another one or distribute assets from the trust to the beneficiary who could be you or your spouse. And, um, so there's still access, ability to modify it. You can sell and change the assets that are in the trust. And so we got but flexibility it, for control and ongoing use. So we have control of it, but it's still pr a protected asset then. It wouldn't be a, a tenant that sues me couldn't go after our primary being in there. Right, right. And what state do you live in? I live in Wisconsin, Merrill Property State. Rental properties are in Arkansas and Pennsylvania. Okay, yeah, so you got properties in several states, but your home's in Wisconsin. Yep. Yeah, so what, what's often common there, and I'll do, you know, real quick, I don't know how much, I don't, when are you gonna kick us off, Jeff? No, you're far, you're, you're fine. I don't have a follow-up uh, training after this, so if so, you're welcome to so, stay, stay on. If you gotta go, I understand. Yeah, so, so this is often what I'll see people do is something like this, um, is of course, you know, everyone should have their, you know, their personal estate planning that says, you know, my will, 
says, upon my death, if there's anything that's not in my trust, put it in my trust. This, this is your family trust. This isn't the asset protection trust. We avoid probate. Nothing that's in this trust goes to through probate upon our death. And, you know, you're holding the bucket while you're alive. But when you pass away, your successor trustee can pick up the bucket and divide the assets among your children. Right. And you could do those in separate trusts like we showed on that one slide. Well, that's great. Perfect. Everybody needs this. You know, Kathy was asking, you know, about doing some estate planning. You know, this is this is something that like Kathy would need or, you know, something that I have. You know, you put the house in there. Um, other than that, my three year old drew this drawing here. You know, this is the planning that everybody needs. Um, well, but what if that house is that main asset that you want to protect? Right. You know, David, maybe you own, like you said, you, you own some other stuff, you know, assets or you have an LLC or something and, 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 and as part of your plan and you say, well, I've got some risk as a result of some of this. How do I get this chip off the table? Well, we create an irrevocable trust over here. And that, that's just why I draw the line there is because we're, we're saying this side is your stuff. This side is not yours. So, um, there's a type of trust that, that works in every state. It's called a third party trust or a, a special power of appointment trust. Or David, you could create a trust like this where you create a trust for someone else or vice versa. Your spouse could create this trust and name you and the kids as the beneficiary, for example. All right, so it's an irrevocable trust. You know, someone's the trustee holding the bucket, put the house in there and then your creditor, if you get sued, can't reach in there and get anything in that trust. Likewise, the beneficiaries down here, anytime you want during lifetime, if there's any money in here, or the, you know, the trustee can allow the beneficiaries to live in the, you know, and use the trust property, that's how you can still use it. But if the beneficiary gets sued, no one can get in, just like your kids. You know, if your kids are down here and you're not giving the assets to them upon your death, you're holding it in trust for them because if they get sued after you pass away, well, their creditor can't get in and leave the inheritance that you left for them. We're just doing this for yourself during lifetime. You're creating something that looks like that now that you can benefit from while you're alive. Now, what if you say, well, I want to sell this house. All right. Trustee sells the house, gets the cash and uses the cash to buy a new house. <laughs> right? It's all happening within the trust. Or you set up an LLC and buy an investment property in the trust. And, and so that can all churn within the trust itself. Or if you've got a bunch of cash in there and you're like, you know what, I need some cash. We'll distribute it out to the beneficiary who can deposit it in their personal account and spend the money. So we, we've still got access to it. We can still use it. But meanwhile, while it's in this trust here, it's protected. And this is one of the nice parts is this trust can still be modified and updated over time. You know, the, the person that created it can hold a power over that trust to make modifications to it without losing the asset protection. So. Thank you. Randy, what's that distinction then where people hear the word irrevocable because it kind of sounds like you can't change just yeah. the nature of the name, right? So explain well, that. Yeah, the word itself, it doesn't help. Right. <laughs> you know, it's called an irrevocable trust. What does that mean? Let's compare it to this one here that is a revocable trust. Revocable means that the person that created it. So, so there's three parties in every trust. There's the settlor or grantor. We use those interchangeably. That's the person that's creating the trust. There's the trustee who's holding the bucket. And they're the steward over the assets in the bucket. They're holding it in trust for the beneficiaries. And then there's the beneficiary who has the potential to receive distributions from it or benefits from it or when you die are going to receive the stuff out of it. All right. So you create the trust as the grantor or the settlor. The trustee is holding the bucket and the beneficiary can receive the stuff. Just repeating myself. Well, revocable means that the grantor that established the trust reserved the right to revoke or amend or take all the stuff back anytime they want. They say, look, I'm holding back all these strings. Whenever I want, I can take it back. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge. Okay, because the grantor or the settlor has the power to do that, 
that opens the door for creditors to get into this trust because it's revocable. So from an asset protection perspective, it's as if it's yours, right? Just because you have all of that, that power. An irrevocable trust, technically speaking, means that the grantor does not retain the right unilaterally to reach in there and say, never mind, give it all back to me. <laughs> so you don't retain the right to revoke or amend it or say, only kidding, give it all back. However, and that's why we can have this line that, that separates the, the trust from you and you can get it off the table. What irrevocable does not mean is that the trust cannot be modified. So the trust can absolutely be modified. It's just how are we going to do that? This trust, you can modify and unwind and amend it and change it anytime you want. This trust can be changed and modified. It's just who is going to do it and how are they going to do it? One of the easiest ways to do that is to give somebody what's called a special power of appointment. And that, I mean, these have been around, the oldest case that I can find is 1806, but this comes all the way up to present. I mean, any estate planning attorney knows what a power of appointment is and they're in every trust that you'll ever see. But, but a special power of appointment is like this little magic wand when we're talking about an irrevocable trust. That the person who holds that magic wand, they can make changes to that trust in any way, except to say, give it to themselves. Okay, so now you've given the power to make changes to your trust to somebody. The beauty is, is that if David creates this trust, he can actually be the one holding that magic wand. So he is the settlor, can't revoke and amend the trust, but he can hold this magic wand to allow him to make changes to the trust, effectively to amend it. <laughs> With one restriction, he can't amend it to say, give the stuff back to himself. But we build other mechanisms in there to to do that if we need to. But you could always refinance, sell it, yeah. change it and live on with it being your house trust. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I refinanced my house a few years ago in a trust like this. And, and I actually, the banks usually like you to take it out, put it in your own name, do the refi and then put it back in after. But but ultimately we, we can do it. So- any, any downfall to doing it that way? To it, during a refi, is that what you're asking? Well, just just in general, married couple, 40, live until they're planted in the ground, uh, wanting the house to pass on to the kids or, or being able to sell and pass on to the kids when they're gone. Is there any downfall to putting the primary residence in an irrevocable that you can think of? Yeah. Well, the downfall is there's an upfront cost to it, which is, you know, with anything you're going to do. Um, because if later years you change your mind, you, you, you paid the upfront cost to do it. Um, in the meantime, it, the assets were protected while it was sitting in there. Um, and um, over time, yeah, it's possible that you want to make modifications to it. And it, it may not be as simple as I just have it in my own name, right? Where we, we just want to follow the protocols. They're not complicated. We just want to follow the protocol. It's the trustee who's selling the house. And the trustee is probably your spouse, mm -hmm. right? So they're the one that signs the sales contract. Um, but we've just kind of divided your personal assets into yeah. two buckets there. And, and both of them will flow the same way upon your death from an inheritance plan standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, but- worth, it, uh, worth the asset protection. What's that? I, I mean, it, it's worth the upfront, the upfront cost you're talking about. It's worth the asset protection. Yeah, that, that's uh, my it, perspective because this is not a replacement for insurance. I mean, we have we want to have insurance coverage for for the, the home and everything like that. Um, so so setting up the trust is in addition to having good insurance coverage for protection. Um, however, if you think of it this way, if you spend some money that that got that you're not paying that on an annual basis is you, you got to set up up front periodically you might have modifications you want to do and things like that but it's kind of a one upfront fee and then potential periodic fees over over the years but it's 
not expensive to maintain and it's simple to unwind and modify. Well, Randy, this is just a further explanation of that example you gave us about the guy that lost his business in the downturn, right? But he did. Yeah, this is exactly what they did, the same drawing. So he retained the property and didn't you even say one of his finance accounts? Yeah, so they, they had his investment account over here and his uh, paid off home over here. So he lost everything. But yeah, they lost the business. They lost their residence to the bank because, I mean, it was leveraged to the hilt. So there, there really wasn't any equity to protect there. But yeah, the business failed from the economy. They lost everything here, personally went bankrupt. But in the bankruptcy, nothing in this side of the table was at risk. I love it. So, you know, putting the planning in place, timing's important, like we talked about, um, where, you know, we want to do this before the wind is blowing. Sometimes, unfortunately, that's when people think about it, is when the wind starts blowing. So if people are aware that, um, you know, most of the business that I have, most of the clients that I serve are referred to me by people like you and more often than not like an insurance, you know, life insurance or financial advisor, because they're, they're aware of the client's um, personal and financial situation. And they can pinpoint saying, hey, you know what you should think about? You know, and then they say, oh yeah, it, it, it seems obvious to them once someone brings it up, but they might not have been thinking about it beforehand. Hey, Randy, uh, this is Corey. I have a quick question just on the diagram you were doing there. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about having the excess funds, for example, that you wanted to distribute to the beneficiaries that are in the trust, does that imply that, for example, if, if the main things are in my name and my spouse is the one who's running the trust, does who's the beneficiary do, do can I be a beneficiary of the trust or does it have to be her how do we get that that arrow across the bottom back to us okay good question so and and this sometimes depends on what state you live in because some states will allow you to create an asset protection like the trust like this and be an eligible beneficiary we call that a self-settled asset protection trust there's only about 16 or 17 states that allow that. Utah is one of them. California is definitely not one of them. But um, you can create an asset protection trust and also be an eligible beneficiary. So the trustee could make distributions directly to you. Um, in other states, and I was describing this like this when David asked his question, where this third party type trust where you say, look, rather than creating the trust for myself, because most states don't like that. And if I get sued in a state that doesn't like that, that trust might not have the protection. If I create a trust for a third party, that will work. Well, that third party is usually most often your spouse and kids. So I create, let's just pretend this is me. I create this trust for my wife and kids and I put stuff into it. I'm not the beneficiary, which is beautiful because if I, I have the risk, if I get sued, it ain't mine. The trustee or the trust or my creditor can't get in there because I can't personally. I don't have the right to just reach in there personally and say, give me the stuff. But I haven't lost access because my spouse is the beneficiary, right? She can live in the house because she's the beneficiary. Now I can live with my spouse, even though I'm not a beneficiary. That, that, that's clear in the laws that, you know, in tax laws and asset protection that you don't have to be a beneficiary to live with your spouse. Um, so, but there's cash in there and I'm like, oh man, we need to buy a new truck and we just don't have, I, I need a little bit of extra cash. Let's take some cash out of the trust so the trust can distribute it to my spouse, right? Trust can't give it to me because I'm not the beneficiary, right? But the trust can, the trust can distribute it to my spouse. And I'll give her some beautiful long hair right here. And then what she does with it is up to her, right? The trustee can't give it to me, but she can. So she can take a distribution and go buy a car and put it in our names or go deposit it in our joint account or spend it on our bills or something like that. The trust can't give it to me. The trust can give it to an eligible beneficiary who does with it what they will at that point. Saying she can be the trustee and the beneficiary. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, and one thing I want to be careful of when I set these up is whoever establishes the trust, I want the assets first to be in that person's name to go into the trust so that the beneficiary spouse isn't putting stuff into it. It, it kind of is going in one direction, if you follow So was that helpful? Yeah, no, that, that explained it. That's the piece I was trying, trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, and, and then we even go a step further is, you know, what if that spouse dies before you do? Well, now you've lost your conduit of access. Well, we'll still build that into the, the plan so that if your spouse dies before you, that this trust actually just pops into this trust. <laughs> At that stage, all the assets go back into that trust, which is now for you for the rest of your life. And, and you'll still have the same protection. I have, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, we get things in the mail all the time about mortgage protection insurance or something like that. Not homeowners insurance, but for like, if something happens to my husband, he becomes disabled or dies or something. Our loan is in his name, but my name is on the deed with his. So is, and I know that has, might not have something to do with what you're talking about today, but I'm not sure. Is that something we should have too, is like mortgage protection insurance? To so, cover our loan, should he become disabled or something like that or can't work for a long time or, you know, yeah, something like I, I that. I think that's an eval something that you evaluate in your own situation. I don't know if there's someone else on this call right now who, who deals with that, who's a, who's a lender or, or deals with insurance that might have another comment, you know, beyond my own knowledge. Um, I think that's- For mortgage something. insurance, it's not for, you know, it's not for homeowner's insurance or anything like that. It's for yeah, mortgage it's protection. Just a, it, yeah, for loss of uh, employment. You, mm -hmm. you, It's like any insurance, you're just, you're paying a premium for some potential future risk. If you can't cover the mortgage, um, uh, you know, I, I think there's. He's, st he's still working. He, he's, you know, he's 60 and he can still, he works for the BA, hospital, BA medical center here in Spokane. So he's got a big promotion and also, but if something happens to him, like knee surgery or something like that, that he has to have here soon, it's been 15 years in the making now, but knee replacements on both of them, but the mortgage protection might protect him maybe from that. Um, if he's, if he doesn't have enough, annual leave or you know sick leave or whatever to cover it i don't know so i'm not sure what whether that's some kind of like affleck insurance or something like you know some kind of a disability insurance or mortgage protection insurance i probably should look into that should that day come yeah yeah and maybe someone else has some thoughts there i don't know jeff if you or someone else um i don't know if we i know alex isn't on the call anymore her husband probably could have answered that but um kathy just consider it like any other insurance i mean we pay premiums for coverage that we hope we never have to use right right and so every time we make that premium it, we feel like it's wasted money until we need it so <laughs> exactly. evaluate that on your own personal situation um uh and just make that decision financially if it makes sense if you think that that's a, a risk in that case okay okay that's all the questions I have, I think, for now. Perfect. Well, you guys that are still on the call, um, if you've got another question, um, let's ask it now or we'll wrap it up. Reach out to me. Um, I'll make sure I get you a copy of these slides. I'm going to put, I just put a link in the chat for you that are still on the call tomorrow. I'm doing at noon, uh, 1031. For us here in Utah, uh, at CE credits, I don't know that he's certified in other states for CE credits for us that are agents, but uh, 1031 exchange for us that are investors as well is another great topic uh, as far as that tax deferral uh, component. And uh, he does a great job. So go ahead and click on that link if you're interested in that. Randy, you're awesome. I appreciate you, man. This is all great information. I hope you guys all have your information. And Dimitri is gonna ask another question before we go. I'm going to ask a million dollar question. Uh, recently, uh, I was attending a presentation that was called how to get into luxury real estate, forget about luxury for now, but uh, what uh, what the guy presenting it said is you need to build relationships with estate attorneys. So the question is, uh, how can an agent become a valuable enough resource for estate planning attorney to actually get referral business? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> 
So, and wh where are you, Dimitri? Uh, I'm in uh, Silicon Valley. San okay, Jose. Silicon Valley, California. Yeah, wh what's the market been doing there? Has it been depressed uh, in the last year? It, it's crazy, it's crazy seller's market. Okay, so it's been going up. Oh yeah, crazy, crazy way up. Dimitri, I think they're selling there and moving here. Yeah, oh yeah, that, absolutely. That is absolutely yeah. true. <laughs> So, so have an answer for him, Randy? Yeah, I don't know anybody that's in the no, it, real estate out there. But 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 I'm not specifically asking yeah. how uh, how you can refer a business, right? Mm -hmm. My expectation is you in Utah, you're working nationwide. But but generally speaking, when you get into situations where actually somebody needs to sell a home, you 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 decide which agent to send uh, to send this referral to, right? So I just want to get a sense of. Do you have some agents that you work with on, pref on preferred basis? How they build the relationship with you? How long you have known, right? Because I, I, I just want to get kind of raw filtered feedback and then figure out what I can do about it. I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I don't that, have any expectations from you. So what that brings to me is, is I all of my business is is referral based, which I'm sure a lot of yours is too, um, and. Very seldom has that been with real estate agents to at least me referring out just because the opportunity hasn't arisen. But now I'm questioning, well, is it because I haven't been asking people that question? You know, when we're talking about their assets, because it, it does come up from time to time where people say, well, I've got this property, but we're selling it. And I usually don't go any further in that because I, I just assume people have a guy, right? That, that's going to help them through that process. And so now that opens the door for me to say, well, are you working with somebody? So, so I think that's helpful. Um, on another hand, I don't do a lot of probate work, but when people are administering estates after someone passes away, that there's a lot of transactions that are going on at that point as well. And so I think probate and estate administration attorneys are good contacts to have. What about divorces? Do you do you have to deal with divorces occasionally? Um, I have a lot of clients who unfortunately have divorced. Um, I don't do divorce law, <laughs> right. so I don't help them through the divorce. But but from the planning side, yes. And so that that's another opportunity as well. Yeah. So I'm I'm getting involved with one of the local divorce group, but I'm still trying I'm still trying to figure out the proper way to work with them because. They seem to have a very different mindset than a lot of other folks I encounter. <laughs> just, yeah. just, just, just the way divorce looks versus uh, general in state planning. It's... I mean, and... my advice would be um, just make that relationship and open that door. So what I'm hearing Randy saying, Randy's so focused on their estate planning and their asset protection. He hears them saying, we're going to sell a property, but it's not necessarily as relevant to what he's doing for them, right? To interject. Um, me, for me as a real estate agent, when my clients say anything that needs the help of a professional, I want to be able to point them in the right direction. That's just a value add. It's a different business being a real estate agent, obviously, than it is an estate planning attorney. Um, so maybe by raising your hand and making that relationship and continually communicating, just like we do with our clients, right? If you don't stay in touch with your clients, they're going to buy and sell with somebody else three years down the road because they haven't heard from you in three years, right? Yep. So may, maybe that's an idea just as a relationship base by like, hey, I just want to remind you that I'm here, maybe pop in once in a while. So when they hear their clients say, I'm selling my property, you are top of mind, possibly. Um, I, I don't put a lot of high hopes on that because professionals are so focused on doing their job well for their clients it's not really that big of a value add, in my opinion, for an attorney to say, oh, by the way, go use my real estate agent. Does that make sense? I, I hear you, but what I'm thinking is potentially creating some content that is going to link real estate with estate planning. Well, you're thinking about your real estate planning, but you should, while you're doing this, think about the direction of real estate markets, think about your real estate portfolio. So I'm just thinking there's got to be a way to link those questions in a way to make it helpful and be a resource for state planning attorney. I don't have the answer yet. And part of the reason for me to ask this question, see if Randy has come across somebody having this answer already. Yeah. 
Well, I, I am a hundred percent believer in what Jeff said is that it, when you're, there's touch points and value added, then you're top of mind. You know, I, I have, you know, the long list of other advisors that I work with over time and those that, that are in front of me and are providing value to me. Like you said, when there's content, there's actually a really good from a marketing perspective. This is totally off topic, but just the, the concept there, there's a marketing book called they ask you answer. And if you just kind of following those, the principles that, that that teaches is people want information or people have questions about lots of things and they're looking online or they're asking people for it. It's like provide that information to them. And so well, what you said, Dimitri was, you know, I want to provide valuable content and get it out there so that they know, and then you get those touch points and yeah, you're going to be who they're thinking of. And then they're not going to have to remember. Well, first you got a name that people are going to remember. <laughs> um, so, you know, Jeff, I mean, how many people are named Jeff, but I mean, you know, Dimitri, people remember that. Right. Well, think of it this way too, Dimitri. Um, by you adding value to your clients, to your family and your friends, and referring them to somebody like Randy creates a backwards relationship. You're pushing your people this way. So when it comes up in the estate planning, hey, it might make sense to juggle some of our assets, you're still connected there. It's kind of like when I send my clients to my preferred lender and they make a connection, even if it was somebody I just met, I am their realtor because we're a team. And when they, they meet me, I send them that value add and then they connect with him. I get pulled along with that. It's the same thing with, with Randy, estate planning, right? It's the same thing with my uh, 1031 exchange with my investors. I own a lot of real estate. I have a lot of investors that come to me because I own a lot of real estate. Well, they need to know about how to defer their taxes when they sell one asset for another one. And so my value is at is introducing them to an attorney that can help them with that. Right. And yeah. this is the information. So that might be another. Well, uh, well, that part I'm doing already. I'm just thinking of going a step further and doing something more proactive, create content, whatever. Right. But yeah. I hear what you're saying. All the stuff. Love awesome. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. We kept Randy Thank you so much. For the time. So thanks for sticking around for some Q&A, Randy. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Reach out if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.